We are very pleased to welcome Dr. George Heckman and Sophie Hogeveen. A very, we'll give a very brief introduction to both of them, although their bios are quite long, so just a brief note. George Heckman is an MD with a specialization in both internal medicine and geriatric medicine. George has an undergrad degree in engineering physics and also holds a master's of mathematics and computer science and a master's of science in health research methodology. George is the Chair in Geriatric Medicine at the Schlegel UW Research Institute for Aging and a Fellow of the inter -Rye. His research interests include management of heart failure in long-term care, chronic disease management of frailty in various care settings, and vascular aging. Sophie Hogeveen holds a PhD and is a Health System Impact Fellow at Women's College Hospital Institute for Health System Solutions in Virtual Care and a Postdoctoral Fellow at the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging. Sophie's research focuses broadly on health services delivery through, through the investigation of decision support systems and innovative care processes that make use of health system resources in a sustainable and equitable manner. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know how to engage with our presenters today. Please type any questions or comments you have in the chat box at any time, and we'll start our question period by 1245. I'll answer the most commonly asked question, can we have a copy of the slides and recording for this webinar? Yes, you can. We'll send them to attendees and post them on our website and YouTube channel. And with that, I'd like to invite George and Sophie to take the stage. All right, hello everybody. Um, it's really great to um, be able to be here with you today. And I wanna thank the RGPO for uh, hosting us and for all of you for being here. Um, is that um, all right, Wendy, can you hear me? We can hear you well. And you can see my slides? We can, it looks like your slides just flipped out a slideshow though. Okay, all right, great. Perfect. Okay, so then we're ready to go. Um, as Wendy mentioned, today I'll be speaking about developing a decision support tool for referral to specialized geriatric services in Ontario. And so first I'll describe some expert perspectives on need for referral to SGS, um, explore patterns and outcomes of health services used by older home care clients, identify determinants of contact with geriatric medicine, and then propose a decision support tool for referral. And we'll finish with an example of how such a tool could be used and has been used um, in the Waterloo Wellington Lynn. Now, um, as I'm sure everyone is aware, and um, it's been said before, that community-based health services, uh, such as home care and outpatient physician services, have important roles in our current healthcare system. Um, but there's a limited availability of such specialized geriatric services in Ontario and in many parts of the country and the world, and in particular, a limited number of geriatricians. So in 2018, uh, it was reported that um, there were 129 geriatricians in Ontario, and a small percentage, or well, about less than 20% reported having their main practice setting in the community. So there's been agreement um, among the experts in the literature that these limited services must be targeted to the most vulnerable and the most complex. Now, I've included this slide defining geriatric medicine and SGS, um, but I feel with this audience, um, this is probably old news. Um, so I'll just leave it there for reference and move on. Um, and again, the geriatric 5Ms is something that um, this audience is probably quite familiar with. Um, but was developed as a communication framework to describe core competencies in geriatrics and to communicate services offered. Um, so it was also meant to be used to guide referral to specialists in geriatrics. And the five M's include mind, mobility, medications, multi-complexity, and matters most. Now I'll come back to the idea of targeting SGS and geriatric medicine to the most vulnerable and complex older adults. 
The Regional Geriatric Programs of Ontario and Interi Canada partnered to create a standardized decision support tool to identify older home care clients who would benefit from referral to SGS. So the home care sector is well positioned to identify complex community dwelling older adults who could benefit from geriatric medicine care. Uh, the majority of clients in of long stay home care clients are older adults. And so this is an appropriate subgroup of the general population to target um, because there's lots of overlap with the individuals served by geriatric medicine, those with complex medical and functional needs. Home care clients are assessed with standardized assessments and there are decision support tools embedded within that could help be used to help guide um, referrals and ensure equitable and timely access to care for those who are most in need. In order to create such a tool though, we have to understand how services are currently used. And unfortunately, there's a lack of empirical evidence that describes the use of SGS and geriatric medicine and different factors associated with their use, particularly by home care clients but also community dwelling older adults in general. So now we'll stop and um, do a quick audience poll. Wendy, uh, could you please post those? Absolutely. Okay, so the first question is, what is your main practice setting? <clears throat> So the results are in, and um, as we expected, based on um, past um, reports, over half reported inpatient as the um, top, their top main practice setting, 56%, 26% reported outpatient, and 18% reported home. So our next question, please. So our next question is actually for you to answer in the chat box. And um, that question is, in your practice, what percentage are home care clients? So we'll just ask participants to type it in the chat box. Let us know. The answers are coming in and it looks quite large from 50 to 85%, one is close to 90, one says about 25% home care, few people are unsure. So it's actually quite a variation between 25 to 90%. Great, thank you for your responses everybody. Um, as we expected, many of you um, do care for a large percentage of home care clients. And so then our last question is, um, in your practice, how often do you collaborate? So meaning um, engage in shared care with home care providers to provide care to long stay home care clients. All right, so um, the results are in, and almost half, 46%, uh, report that they collaborate on a weekly basis, 20% um, said daily, 14% um, monthly, and 18% less than monthly. All right, so now we have a better idea of um, what reality is like for, for all of you here. And um, so I want to thank you for participating in that poll. Um, and so I'll move on and talk a bit more about what I found. 
and I just want to um, check if I have the chat box open. Is that still, can everyone still see um, my slides or is that in the way, Wendy? No, we can see. Okay, I think that's just for me then. Great. Um, so now we will move on. Okay, um, so one of the first steps in engaging in this research was um, a study of expert perspectives. And um, that some of you may have participated, and if you did, thank you. Um, we interviewed experts in the care of older adults to learn their perspectives on um, need for referral to SGS. And that included um, those involved in geriatric medicine, geriatric psychiatry, nursing, primary care, and home and community care. Participants identified several barriers to referral, included limit, including limited services available and a complicated referral process, accessibility barriers, um, including, um, sorry, a poor understanding of the availability and benefit of SGS services on the part of other care providers, and poor collaboration and follow-up between care providers. Characteristics that were identified as important for referral were consistent with the five M's. Um, so cognition and mental health issues, multimorbidity and multi-complexity, mobility issues, medications. They also rated um, the following as important, recent or significant decline in potential for reversibility, acute illness or events triggering major change, risk of institutionalization, multiple acute care visits, caregiver distress, and need for proactive referral. Now, um, I, before I dig deeper into on this topic using the data that we have available, some more quantitative methods, I just wanted to uh, describe briefly the resident assessment instrument, home care, or IHC, um, because that's one of the data sources that I used to look at this question. Um, and so this is, um, as I've alluded to, my study focused on home care clients and every home care client that's expected to receive services for 60 days or more has a standardized assessment completed. Prior to 2018, the mandated assessment was the resident instrument, or the RIHC, sorry. Um, it included, in, includes embedded decisions or tools used for care planning, outcome measures, resource allocation, decision making, and other applications. This tool does not contain a measure of physician services use, but is linkable to administrative services use data. It was actually replaced in 2018 by a newer version known as the Inter-IHC, uh, but this tool has not yet been linked to administrative services use data. Um, so the study that I'm presenting will um, focus on data that was collected using the IHC prior to 2018. To start off, I took more of a big picture approach looking into the patterns and outcomes of different services used by older home care clients. So those are uh, older adults, 60 years of age and older, long stay meaning that they're expected to be receiving home care services for 60 days or more. And I looked at their contact with physicians on an outpatient basis, unplanned ED visits, hospital admissions, um, during different time periods, but um, I'll mainly be reporting on the 90 days following their home care admission assessment. And then next, I um, looked at the factors associated um, with specifically contact with a geriatric specialist. So those in the OHIP um, billing records, that's um, billing records where the specialty is identified as a geriatrician. Now, the majority of older home care clients were in contact with physicians in the 90 days post-assessment, almost half of whom had four or more contacts with physicians during that same time period. The large majority of <coughs> clients were in contact with family physicians and almost four, almost one quarter had four or more contacts. Other disciplines most commonly seen were internal medicine, ophthalmology, and orthopedic surgery. Only 5.2% of home care clients had any contact with a geriatrician. By their frequent contact with other physician disciplines, 
It appears that these individuals had medical needs, but they were not being seen by a geriatrician. So it may be that there was a lack of services available, um, long wait lists, poor understanding of when to refer. Uh, there's also differential access across the limbs, meaning that um, rates of contact in different limbs um, were different and suggesting that we may need to increase capacity and improve the distribution of services across the province. Frequent contact with family medicine did not appear to result in contact with geriatric medicine. However, as contact with family medicine increased, there was a higher rate of contact with internal medicine, again suggesting that there, these are clients that have medical needs and may benefit from geriatric care. Um, but there's perhaps a need for improved collaboration between community-based care providers and a greater awareness of the role of geriatric medicine. Other issues within the referral process and barriers to access, again, like um, wait lists or just lack of availability of services may also have come into play. The finding, I also did um, an examination of um, some factors associated with specialist contact. Um, so not just geriatric medicine, but also internal medicine. And that included the 5M score. So by mapping items from the conceptual definition of the 5M score, I was able to, so I mapped that to items in the RIHC um, to develop a, um, a scale from the data reflecting the 5M score. And here the findings revealed that characteristics that drove one tended to be the inverse of characteristics driving contact with the other um, specialty discipline. 5M score was associated with higher odds of geriatric medicine contact, um, as it, it would ex be expected to be, um, but actually lower odds of contact with internal medicine. Older adults who had medical complexity and stability had lower odds of geriatric medicine contact, but higher odds of internal medicine contact. These findings might reflect a lack of understanding of the expertise and role of geriatric medicine, or perhaps that geriatric medicine isn't playing as much of a role um, in terms of its roots in internal medicine. Um, again, those barriers that I've already mentioned may also be preventing physicians from referring clients with more acute issues to geriatrics. Next, I looked at some outcomes of geriatric medicine contact. So it was actually, contact with geriatric medicine was actually associated with lower odds of subsequent acute care services use. Um, and, but if you look at contact with internal medicine, this was associated with higher odds of AD visits or hospitalization. Um, the findings might suggest that we need a more upstream approach where geriatric medicine um, becomes involved before a client has a high level of medical complexity and instability or high risk of unplanned ED visits to better prevent um, acute care services use. Now I'll tell you a bit about the model that I created. So um, trying to um, basically consider all of the factors that might be associated with contact with geriatric medicine in the days following um, home care admission and trying to see which of those factors um, were significant in that model. And so my final model was adjusted for um, regional effects, so clustered by Lynn, um, and contained these items that you see here that have been categorized according to the behavioral model of health services utilization, which basically says that um, predisposing are things that, characteristics that exist prior to the onset of illness that make a person more or less likely to use health services. Enabling is um, factors that enable or um, impede access to care once they have identified a need. And then need factors are those sort of the more immediate reasons for seeking health care. And so we can see that the green arrows are actually indicate that that factor is associated with lower odds of contact with geriatric medicine within this final model. And the red arrow indicates that that factor is associated with higher odds 
of contact with geriatric medicine within the final model. In general, need pet variables were more important than predisposing or enabling variables, which um, is indicative of um, more equitable access to care. But when we look at some of these factors, we see that issues like accessing the home and impaired locomotion outside of the home are associated with lower odds, which suggests that these are some barriers to accessing that kind of care. Um, we also see that conditions that are typical of old age, risk of caregiver distress and institutionalization were associated with higher odds of contact, while um, some of these um, more acute or um, medically complex issues were associated with lower odds. And so these results are not entirely aligned with the factors that were considered important for referral to SGS by the experts that we interviewed. Um, and it appears that a segment of home care clients may be missing out on specialized geriatric care, despite having needs identified as important for referral. And again, that an issue as, of accessibility may act as, bar as barriers preventing access to care. So the findings suggest that only a subset of home care clients with cognitive impairment who are at risk for caregiver distress and institutionalization have had contact with geriatric medicine. But there's a subset that may have complex medical complexity and instability and other chronic issues who are in frequent contact with physicians in general, but not in contact with geriatric medicine. But provincial experts that we spoke to agreed that these are groups that would benefit. So a standardized decision support tool embedded in regular home care assessment and care planning processes could help to rationally and equitably allocate limited SGS resources. And a combination of existing skills from the inter-assessment systems could be used to capture a reasonably sized target group population's referral, recognizing that these resources are inherently limited. And before I continue, I just wanted to look specifically at um, if we were to use the 5M score. And here you can see how I operationalized it using items from the RIHC. Um, and you can see how the home care clients in the sample are distributed according to score. And here, if we look again, you can see that 49% are in levels four and five. And as um, score increases, the odds of contact with geriatric medicine um, increase. So that this, the five M's actually um, are nicely associated with contact, um, but this kind of a group is just too large for um, our current situation in terms of the resource constraints. Um, so what we can do is use the 5M score to capture people who have needs that fall within the expertise of SGS. Um, but we can further limit that by also um, using the MAPLE, which is an indicator of caregiver distress, and risk of caregiver distress and institutionalization to capture people already benefiting from contact with geriatric medicine, and use CHESS, which is an indicator of medical complexity and stability to capture people who have medical needs who would benefit from seeing a geriatrician and the expertise that they have, but have not been in contact with them in the past. Um, so we've created um, three levels of priority, not, um, not that, you know, all, like all of these clients, being home care clients and having these complex medical and functional needs would all benefit from seeing a geriatrician, but to sort of prioritize um, that group that has those 5M needs and this risk of institutionalization and caregiver distress and the medical complexity and instability is sort of the top priority group um, for referral to SGS. And this is a tool that um, we're still in discussion um, of how this tool could be used within by home care coordinators or other care providers in the community. Um, but now um, George will tell you a bit about um, one example of how this kind of tool is used. And so I will pass it over to George to speak. Um, and I will control the slides. So George, 
Um, if you just let me know when you want to move on, I will okay. move forward. All right. So again, sorry I came late. Um, it's it's snowy here, <laughs> and and one of the roads was closed, and I finally get here, and my computer does not want to connect to Edge of Rome. So I'm 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 racking up the the bills on my uh, data plan right now through a mobile hotspot. So uh, thank you for for this opportunity. Thank you all for being here for listening in, and. Um, I've been working um, in Waterloo, Wellington for a long time, and I've had contacts with the Lynn on an ongoing basis to provide input in terms of questions related to system planning. And so one of the questions that we had arose from the fact that Waterloo, Wellington is designated as an underserviced area in Ontario for uh, geriatric services. And uh, it's, uh, the problem is even more acute these days. Uh, with uh, an, an avail unavailability of, of additional geriatricians. And so what we wanted to find out is, uh, are the patients on the wait list for outpatient geriatric services at this time, do they reflect uh, what uh, the algorithm suggests? And um, how what might we operationalize a system where we start using these triggers to flag people who should have that assessment. So as Sophie points out, uh, with the data, there is a benefit in terms of acute service uh, utilization, and that benefit is of the same order of magnitude as some other clinical trials uh, that have been done. Um, I think, for example, uh, in the UK, uh, Chalice et al. published a an RCT in 2004 in Age and Aging, and what was interesting for that trial is they were interested in the impact of comprehensive geriatric assessment by specialized geriatricians on nursing home placement for people who are on the designated nursing home list. So these folks would uh, basically look like the high maples uh, in this algorithm. And they were able to reduce institutionalization rates by about 25%. So the data that Sophie's talking about is population level for Ontario. The impact of the geriatrician is consistent with what our CTs show. So ideally we wanna get these folks seen. And so we were interested in finding out what is going on in our neck of the woods uh, to begin with and whether and how we could use this algorithm to start flagging folks for geriatric consultation. But also uh, where could we use this as an instrument to define our local needs for geriatricians. And there's different ways to do this. But the benefit here is not only do you know how many geriatricians you might need, but you have a place for them to start working. So, so really that's, uh, that's some of the conversation that we had. So Sophie, if you can move this to the next slide. So these are data from a year ago, and the numbers are more or less the same. And so the entire 5M cohort, the bottom line in Waterloo, Wellington, uh, slightly less than a year ago was 2,300 long stay home care clients. So that's that 49% group. Of these, uh, there were 143 who were at the highest risk. Um, in fact, we even were more restrictive than the configuration of the algorithm at this time. We were just interested in the highest chest and the highest maple and the highest five M's, and there were 143 in long stay home care. Only 3% of these 143 had had a referral to SGS. And so obviously the folks who are being referred are, are, are being referred because someone feels they need to be referred and we can't, you know, we can't ignore that. Someone has considered them to require an assessment. But when we're thinking about who's at highest risk of ending up in a nursing home, ending up in the eMERGE, uh, we're not seeing these people. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide, please. So at this time, the question is how do we, you know, reorganize the approach to geriatric referrals for the community in a way that is manageable, in a way that uh, allows the highest need folks to be seen sooner than later? Um, and then how do we support primary care for the others using e-consults at this point? 
Um, but I think one of the, the points to make as well is that while our resources as an SGS community are certainly not at this time sufficient, um, we need to think about what the data shows. The data shows that contact with the geriatrician-led SGS makes the difference. And so we have an evidence-based intervention that uh, I think we want to make sure we resist the temptation to substitute. Um, and, and that's one of the conversations that we have. You know, how about internal medicine? Some people will say, well, we see what the data shows. Uh, the signals in terms of acute care use go the other way. And so we need to be very, I think, um, uh, consistent with what the data shows is this is an intervention that works. Here is a method for identifying people to get that intervention. Yes, at this time, we don't have enough of that intervention, uh, but certainly we have a more robust policy argument to, to get people like the oral colleges to open up spots to allow more geriatric medicine uh, residents to actually train and do geriatrics. I think we're still out of 16 uh, medical schools, only six of them have mandatory rotations. And so, um, again, Waterloo Wellington is uh, currently uh, using other estimates felt to be short of seven geriatricians. Um, and again, we can probably repeat this analysis for geriatric psychiatry, potentially even care of the elderly physicians. Um, if we look at the home care data that we have for Waterloo Wellington, uh, we can basically say that if we were to have all of the 5M uh, folks, that 49%, that's five geriatricians right there uh, who would see about 500 new consults a year. So Sophie, if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. So at this time, I think it's a bit of a game changer. Um, we have established services where referrals are made based on what people think ought to happen. Uh, we, we note that this approach does not get the highest risk folks uh, into the system. And so we need to figure out how we can use this decision support approach to build a more uh, equitable or responsive system. And also not just for now, but also thinking about the future, the near future, because, you know, this is a problem that we have right now. Um, and so... Uh, Sophie, if you can go to the next, I think, I think we're done. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge um, everyone who um, participated in this work. Um, John Hernies, who's my PhD supervisor, and George and the other members of my committee, their GPO, um, Kelly Millen in particular, and Melissa Zeraldo and Ian Zorin, and the Ministry of Health, as well as the Geri Geriatric Priority Service Working Group, and all those who participated in, um, in the study and were interviewed and surveyed. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you both for this uh, very interesting presentation. And we've got plenty of time now for people to ask questions. So we encourage people to use the chat box, make sure you're set to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your questions or comments for George and Sophie, and we'll start answering those now. So one of the first ones that has come through, somebody's asking, is the five M's a standardized tool for assessment? So there may be some confusion about how to use the five M's or, or what exactly um, the decision tool was in its entirety that you used. So I, and I can answer that because I was at that uh, meeting where it all came together. So the, U, the American Geriatric Society had developed a framework to uh, to explain to other people uh, what geriatric medicine is all about. And they had something called the 4M framework. And a couple of years ago, uh, Mary Tinetti, who had developed this, and uh, Frank Molnar and I and a few others met in, at the CGS uh, meeting in Toronto, um, had a discussion about that. And the thing about what matters most, sort of advanced care directives and patient goals was added to make 5M because five is a rounder number and we have five fingers. But what you can see is that the whole idea of 5M fits quite nicely with what the feedback was from the uh, qualitative work that Sophie did, but also uh, what the data shows, at least in terms of those who are referred, you see that uh, there is a construct validity there about the 5M framework for who gets referred. 
Okay, great. I'll just add to that. Um, so the way that I operationalized it using intra-assessment data is to look at each of the five M's as sort of a flag. So participants or um, clients got a score of zero to five. So if they um, checked off any of items related to um, mind, then they would get a score of one. Anything related to Medicaid or like um, polypharmacy, they get a score for, for medications and, and so on. So um, there were a number of factors that went into each of the M's and if they, they checked off any of those, they would get a score um, for, uh, of one up to a total of five. five. Okay, great. Um, I guess one of the questions that hasn't been asked yet, but might be, is uh, when the decision-making tool might be published or launched for others to use, including the way you flagged and scored 5Ms. Yeah, so um, it's actually just been approved by the INTRI Committee for um, Systems and, and Tools, sort of the Scientific Committee. So we're working on um, finalizing the official code for that and pushing it through to um, the home care um, lens or whatever, however they exist now, um, so that it would be a, a standard output when the home care assessments of the right HC is completed, just as they automatically get a chest score, maple score, whatever, that they would get a score for this tool. Okay, and that might have answered another question that came through is, will it actually be embedded within the RIE? Yes. Okay. Any time frame on when we might see this or any ideas? Um, I don't know the time frame for um, getting things approved at the LIN side of things. Um, so we're pretty close, I would say, within a month or so to have something ready to go to them. George, do you have any idea? I think the question is, uh, I, 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 can, I can find out and circle back. So the, the more recent scale that's been approved for the RIH seems Andrew Costa's divert. And that was not too long after it was approved by the ISD committee that it was, you know, once, once the scale is approved, it's a matter of writing the algorithm down in code and you send it off to Kai high and it gets supported. So four or five months around then, my guess, but might be sooner because the IST just approved it. So, and it's not a very complicated algorithm. Great, thanks for that additional insight. Um, another question came through, any thoughts on how you might use this tool to include geriatric medicine and geriatric psychiatry? George, do you want to answer first from a clinical perspective? Sorry, I, can you, is it including geriatric medicine and psychiatry together or I wasn't quite sure what you were asking, sorry. Um, so that's all that the question asked. So maybe I'll ask the person who has written that in to provide a, oh, oh okay. yeah, the person said yes, integrated care. Okay, so I think, um, my suspicion is we would be very easily able to repeat this analysis using geriatric psychiatry uh, billing codes. Um, we'd want to look at, um, at uh, we want to make sure we look at the outcome. So in this situation, you know, when someone is medically unstable, uh, acute care utilization is probably the right thing to do. And I suspect if there are mood and behavioral issues we would probably be looking at ED visits as well. We could also look at some of the indicators and the instrument itself, looking at mood and mood scales and behavioral scales. Um, the interesting thing about, about shared care and integrated care, um, I have a student who is currently working on a scoping review, but what the literature shows is, um, it was an interesting article from the CMAJ in 2013 where they looked at the characteristics of high functioning primary care. And so for that study, they essentially, it was a chart review, and they looked at quality indicators for two acute care illnesses. One was upper respiratory tract symptoms, and the other one was diarrhea or something like that. Um, and the other one was two chronic illnesses, coronary disease and diabetes. 
And so they looked at how well the teams were able to achieve higher scores on the quality indicators. And one of them was the presence of a specialist working in an embedded fashion with primary care. We also have the GRACE model in Indiana. So Stephen Council did a randomized trial a little over 10 years ago. And what was interesting about that is they identified people based on risk. So again, the whole concept of priority, they used insurance data because it's the states, I guess, and that's what you use. But they had a team conduct an assessment and essentially collaborate with the patient and the family doctor and bring in the specialist geriatric medicine and psychiatry. So, um, you know, are there trials of what I, an ideal shared care methodology, uh, do they exist? I don't think so. But on the, on the, from a practical purpose, as a practicing geriatrician, what I find is that um, most of the time, I wish I had access to a psychiatrist right away. I wish I had access to BSO right away, but even within SGS, we've built some walls in terms of getting folks to move in and out uh, and get services in and out in a timely way for me as a specialist. Um, but to my mind, this is the key bit, is if we can get SGS, meaning care of the elderly, psychiatry, medicine, BSO, physical therapy in a way that can support primary care with these folks, it would certainly be a lot more uh, uh, acceptable. Okay. Um, there's a question about any thoughts as to how the services of geriatricians will collaborate with the Ontario health teams being currently implemented. That's a, a large question I know, but maybe in the context of uh, the development of this tool. Well, everyone's got access to the Rye Home Care. Well, everyone should. <laughs> so, so for system integration, there's got to be a shared language. And it's there, but it's not shared. And so that's one of the things that needs to happen is it needs to be made available. right? And, and so these algorithms need to be made available in a way that's actionable and understandable. Um, and I think a lot of the Ontario health teams are focusing on chronic disease and geriatrics. And I think we need to think about um, how, do we, how do we facilitate this idea of a shared care model? Um, you know, these folks are unstable. For those who don't know the CHESS scale, um, if you have a CHESS score of four to five in home care, you have a 50 to 70% three month risk of ending up in, a care, in acute care. So that's what that means. So, Weightless, you know, beyond a couple of weeks, you start having people decant into acute care. So that's the kind of uh, thing we need to think about is how do we bring the specialists to bear in a way that supports primary care and, and gets those folks seen sooner than later. Okay. Um, and I guess, you know, I don't know if you looked at this as part of the research, but you, you found that these very frail folks in need of referral to specialized geriatric services, two to 3% of them weren't getting the referral. Conversely, were there others getting referrals who perhaps didn't need them and are using the services that are badly needed by others? I don't know, Sophie, did we look at the character? Oh, well, we'd have to look at the characteristics of those on the wait list. And I think it, it get, gets the notion of referral if I'm a family doctor and I think that I need input from a geriatrician, um, I'm allowed to get that input. And, and even if this person may not have all these five M's and has a low chest and a low maple, as a primary care practitioner, I'm, I've got a question. And so to me, any referral is appropriate. In a broader context of the Ontario health teams though, um, especially if you have more integration of the specialists with primary care, then you have opportunities for capacity building. And so the whole approach of me getting a referral, um, scheduling a referral, bringing the patient in, dictating a five page note, mailing it back, and never really have a chance to discuss it with the physician or the nurse practitioner, doesn't work. Uh, I work in a family health team, I'm embedded. 
and you know we share the EMR. If there's a problem, I go down the hall to talk to the family doctor and we sort it out. And it's an opportunity for me to learn about what primary care is. And it's been very humbling. It's also an opportunity for me to teach, um, you know, especially if, you know, quote unquote, we don't think they're appropriate referrals. I, I don't think all referrals are fine, but if it's something that I could help the family doctor with the next time, I think that's really the approach, the ethos. Great, uh, great point too about capacity building, right? And sharing knowledge and working together. Um, the, somebody had asked a question about having NPs involved within the process, and I think you've sort of answered that. I don't know if you, you have more to add to NPs. I think I work with a lot of nurse practitioners all the time. So I think keeping in mind that Sophie's work was based on physician billing codes. So you know, what we're looking at is the impact of a service, however it's configured, that has the doctor in it. Um, keeping that in mind, I think the team is critical. And uh, I work a lot in heart failure clinics. I work in, work in primary care. And I find that the nurse, uh, the nurse practitioner, the CNSs, are certainly a lot more skilled than I could ever be at the ongoing management assessment and especially the self-care education for the, the patient. If, if they've got a question, um, they can answer that call, they can talk to them, but they've got these assessment skills. You know, is that question something easily solved or is there something more sinister lurking? Is the heart failure decompensating? You know, or is there any drug side effect? So um, the whole notion of team-based care, especially for home care where they're really high risk, uh, to me is critical. And, and however you configure the team, as long as you meet the needs of the patients, I think any combination works. Great. Um, Kelly Mill from the RGPO um, has a comment as well. Kelly, did you want to unmute and speak to it or? Yeah, it, it, um, it was just in relation to, um, I think the OHT question is that um, we do have a newly, um, uh, funded um, provincial governance office uh, for geriatrics and um, it, it includes uh, geriatric psychiatry medicine and um, uh, care of the elderly as well as uh, the associated interprofessional teams that support those uh, um, specialists and uh, they are um, connecting through RISE uh, um, which is the body that uh, kind of pushes uh, resources and, and contacts to uh, OHTs and are targeting specifically those OHTs that have flagged older adults as a target population um, and, uh, and providing kind of a position statement on resources, services, and contacts in um, those communities that uh, are working on um, their uh, OHT, either at the, they've already implemented and are proceeding past the full application or moving towards the full application. Thanks. Great. There's a few uh, other questions here. One is asking about the number of geriatricians needed in an area. I don't know if you have that type of data available. That's the... Uh, so I could, could I jump in, George? Yeah, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. So I know um, there was that provincial number like for 65,000 or 65 plus, um, it was uh, one FTE uh, geriatric medicine for 10,000. Um, was what was put together. Uh, that was some of the work that Dr. Michael Borey had pulled together. Um, and that was uh, used when we did an asset mapping recently with the province of Ontario. Um, and that information can also be made available if people are interested in those reports, because it kind of maps out what is the existing FTEs for care of the elderly and geriatric medicine. Um, and, uh, and then what are uh, some of the projected uh, volumes of um, those FTEs that are required to meet the uh, um, population uh, growth demands. I, I also point out, so, so the data that my, Michael's done tons of work on this and, and I think they're writing something up so I'm looking forward to reading it. The figure of 1 in 10,000 is from a 1991 paper uh, in the Annals of the Royal College and it was based on some focus groups from about a dozen geriatricians and it may be that the numbers still work, um, but um, I think one of the challenges is 
you know, let's say we, we hire seven geriatricians but don't have a place where referrals can be made available to them, then they go elsewhere and, and we've had that in some areas. Um, the, the idea here is to pick a sector and identify how to, and figure out how to identify people who should be seen. Um, there's a bit of a conceptual shift here, right? Um, it's no longer only by referral, it's more like a stroke pathway in my neck of the woods. If I develop symptoms of a stroke, EMR takes me to Grand River Hospital and there's a protocol and things happen. If I have an ST segment elevation MI, um, I go to St. Mary's and things happen. If you're a home care client and you flag that you should see a geriatrician, I don't see why we shouldn't handle it the same way. Again, the event rates for these people are high and the sooner we intervene, the more we can have a, an impact. So for home care, we can use the RIE. For community support services, there's the CHA, which is basically the same thing. So we could build this algorithm into the CHA. For acute care, in our region, we use the assessment urgency algorithm and the higher scores for that identify people who could see a geriatrician too. So there's ways to have instruments that are validated and, and standardized and identify people who would benefit from the intervention. It's ultimately a matter of counting them. There may be a certain overlap between the populations, but um, that's probably how you wanna do it. Nursing homes is interesting because um, I, we could repeat the exercise with nursing homes, but we know that across the, the country, very few geriatricians go into nursing homes. And I've been doing nursing home medicine for a long time, and I could happily occupy myself, uh, you know, a full couple of days a month seeing consults in nursing homes, again, in a shared care model. So there's ways of looking across sectors and applying evidence-based instrumentation and calculating the needs. And, uh, um, but the flip side to doing that is you know, you know the needs of which patients in which sector and you can design a, 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 a care process around that as opposed to saying, let's bring in five geriatricians, but we haven't thought about where they would see their consults. So the benefit of having a sector specific information systems is you can not only predict the need, but also flag and create the system around that. Wonderful. Thank you for that very comprehensive um, answer. So we want to say thank you very much to George and Sophie today. This was a really great learning opportunity and we look forward to having this introduced in the inter -I. And we want to thank everyone for attending the webinar as well. You'll receive a short evaluation survey by email. So we'd ask that you share your suggestions on topics for future webinars with us. And we'd also like to highlight um, free resources that we hope every webinar attendee will share with caregivers of older adults with frailty. Caregiving Strategies comprises online course, handbook, and website, which were developed by the RGPs of Ontario with caregivers and healthcare providers as co-creators. And we'll circulate a flyer to help you spread the word. And finally, we'd like to invite you to our upcoming webinar on March 27th, entitled Special Telehealth Webinar Mini-Series Part 2, Practical Use of OTN with Frail Older Adults, with Dr. Philip Lamb and Cindy Wasaloo. <clears throat> and registration information for this webinar will be emailed soon. So thanks again to everybody. We're signing off now, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>